If you'd been picking Team Liquid players like Twists, Elige, to do well at ESL1 New York in esports pools, fantasy esports tournaments, you'd probably have done pretty well. You know, they wouldn't have been the most expensive players in the tournament. If you'd have been able to correctly predict that they would win against the likes of SK Gaming, Astralis, you would have won pretty big because the odds would have been really nice for you on esports pools with their betting features. During the games, as you saw them playing Great Counter-Strike, you could have used the in-play betting, picked out different aspects that you thought would happen in future maps. Now, Team Liquid's potential is not only real, as we saw at these last two events, ESG Tour, Mykonos, and ESL1 New York, but it is unleashed. And here's the sick news. I don't think they've even hit the peak of their potential then. These weren't one-off runs that showed everything they had and everything went right. There was some very, very real foundational elements on display here, elements that absolutely are replicable, look like they're going to work often, come from a real philosophy, the pieces within the team work, and I think there's still more you can see, more to come from this lineup. So one of the reasons why this lineup, why Team Liquid is a core rather, never really unleashed their potential because every lineup they had since they got Hiko and Simple into the team, I mean, even before Simple, in fact, even when they just had the lineup that was like Fogli, Hiko, Adren, Nitro, Elige, even from then onwards, they've always had this really high level of potential that I would actually argue has only gotten higher over time with different lineups. So you've got Simple into the lineup, obviously a very dangerous weapon, potential goes up even more. Then later on, even with Pimp in the team, because Elige emerged as a star, there's a lot still could have been done with that team. And now this lineup with twists, and especially this move to make Nitro the game leader has taken them to a whole nother level as a team and i still feel like they can go further so one of the main reasons i think they never really unleashed that potential before was lack of what i would call working in game leadership they had people who played the role but i don't think any of them were very effective at actually unleashing the team and activating certain players so the closest they had to what i'd call a re in game leader was actually daps a long long time ago very briefly in team liquid he was quickly moved out of the team that wasn't one of the lamps that had a lot of potential anyway Adren just didn't work out. He was he was too cookie cutter in the way he did things. He really didn't seem to be like 100% driven to win in the same sense. His own play was pretty bad. And he never really seemed to understand how to use Fogley, how to use Nitro. He always seemed to, to lack some, there was some kind of disconnect between how he wanted to run the game and how they run to run the game. Because they really needed to actually, to some degree, be forced in a certain roles and be told this is what's better for you than what you think. I think that... Hiko and Nitro were obvious train wrecks in the past. Nitro only used to do it for a month or so, and often I got the feeling just to cover poor play of his own. Hiko did it because no one else in the team in theory could do it. He was playing badly himself, and he thought logically, we've got enough firepower here. If I just somehow sort of lurk and shot call from the back, it'll work. It didn't really work, and it actually tanked Hiko's game even more. Stanislaw came in, billed as this great in-game leader for the fantastic things he did in Optic, also a team with a lot of talent, a lot of diverse weapons, orpers, riflers, entry fraggers. You'd think Team Liquid should have been a perfect fit for him. Somehow he couldn't activate the talent either, and it cost his own individual style. He never was as good at those great flanks that he was when he was over on... Uh, optic as he when he was in team liquid now his individual fragging was still pretty good for an in-game leader he was one of the best fraggers we actually had in the game he just wasn't that great at the in-game leading it felt like something wasn't quite on with his role and i have to say part of it i don't blame for him blame on him rather because i actually think part of it is that nitro never dedicated himself to being that entry and that kind of crazy initial and en opening guy that he can be partly because he was left to kind of pick what role he wanted and have some say in it, and he was one of the old guard in that sense. I think Nitro becoming an in-game leader not only opened up everyone else's game and Stanislaw's, but also it put Nitro into the right position after he'd assessed the game, whereas Stanislaw perhaps naively thought, well, I'm sure Nitro knows what's best for him. I have to say, in the team they have now, Stanislaw having swapped from being an in-game leader to the, to the secondary caller, first of all, I can't know what calls he's making, but I would speculate he's doing a good job there. Because first of all, by being the lurker and the guy who's in flank positions all the time, he's getting a really good read on the other side of the map, I've noticed in many situations. They often start their attack on one side of the map and he'll be playing the other side, giving info, potentially making calls. And they have been a team that has been quite slow on the T side, built things up with a proper entry and trade style, using utility, and then explodes onto the site at the end. So European style Counter-Strike. And the fact that they make so 
many good late round calls where they will decide to go back from a site where they've lost someone or decide that they've baited out the call makes me think he is having some impact in that sense. As an individual player, here's what's bizarre. He has been terrible as a fragger at ESO1 New York. At Mykonos, he was fine. He had some big games. He had some games that weren't as good. But when he was at ESO1 New York, not only was his fragging really terrible, he finished the event minus 87, in case you're wondering, but also, in terms of plus minus, also, he missed many huge chances to get two big kills when he perfectly had flanked people. Now, in a way, that's not as bad because I really don't think he's going to have an event as bad as that where he starts every game 0 to 6, 0 to 7, where he goes, has such a terrible performance because actually, as a fragger, he's a pretty decent fragger. And I also think, as in terms of a flanker and someone who plays like a lurk style role, I think he's pretty good at it actually. Part of what made him look so silly is that he constantly got into these amazing positions and made these decisive moves. And I actually think that's a good thing. Because first of all, it's actually adding in an extra element to Team Liquid's game where they're not just setting up, getting onto one site and then trying to win off aim duels. He's adding an extra danger element around the map and also making reads and, and actually potentially adding some kind of shot calling to what Nitro is doing, which is more simple. But I also think it's really key that they have someone who takes decisive moves. Because when Stanislaw rotates, he uh, makes a flag. He just does it immediately. He doesn't hesitate. He doesn't try to look for information. He make, he, he reads the game and he knows what opening's there and he makes a move. That's great because I feel like that is a component that's throwing opponents off guard, allowing the others' fragging power to have more of an impact. And crucially, I think it's part of actually why they're winning out in a lot of the close tight games where famously they used to fall apart because they didn't have a real in-game leader and they didn't have a proper structure where people all could do these things over and over again regardless of whether they got the frag now, which they do have in Team Liquid now. So I think in general, he's done a pretty good job. The fact that they could go minus 87 and they could get to the final still and almost won him up against FaZe, a team who rolled every other team at the event, is a very positive sign because I don't think he's going to have bad tournaments like that over and over again. If he even had just half as bad a tournament, like minus 43, they actually could have won maps in the final here and, and really challenged FaZe. Nitro switching to in-game leader has been incredible. It has been a revelation because, first of all, as an in-game leader, he seems to be doing his, de his homework on the demos. They're getting good T-sides consistently across the, the base of them, the foundational base of their map pool. They're a team that even was able to get rounds on T-side of cash, a map they don't really play. Not only that, as well as doing his homework as an in-game leader, first of all, with under him, Twists has continued to look fantastic, so he hasn't messed up any of the kind of flow of the stars of the team. And he has now been, presumably because he looked at what they needed in the team, they have a bunch of passive players in Stanislaw, Elige, JDM. He's looked and seen, we need a bit more aggression here, we need someone. And so he's there as an entry guy, and the way he is activating Twists reminds me of late 2015, where Elige started to play more heavy on the entry side and was activating Nitro and making Nitro the star player who'd run in and one-bullet people. Now Twists kind of plays that role because he has even even nuttier aim than Nitro did, and Nitro did have good aim. I think Nitro's actually, despite the fact, yes, his stats are terrible, he's a great example of someone who's doing a good job as an in-game leader, and especially what he's doing in terms of his role within the team, he's being very unselfish, and I love the way he's activating his star players. Then you've got to consider, Twists really is standing out as a superstar player right now. Not just a star, superstar. This guy's like entering top 10 in the world territory. He's still young, hence he's had these two finals that he's kind of flunked. He flunked the Mykonos final in stats. The final of um, ESO New York, I thought he was terrible and he looked really shook for the first map and a half and then he just never could get his game rolling because he's got such deadly first few bullets with an AK and that just was not present in that final. Probably a little bit intimidated, never been in big finals before, but he's so talented. He's pushed the team up to a level where they can get to these finals but he's also too young he's like 17 years old too young to necessarily win in these finals so give him a little bit more time and he will come through i have a sense i don't know maybe maybe he'll be like a device person who's plagued for a while but i feel like he's got a good mentality these are his initial opinion uh, initial kind of forays into finals you don't judge someone just off the first one or two finals they get they get more than that people like device were in a lot more big games before we really labeled them as like permanent jokers and that they'd never make it etc i do think that it's also a positive sign that considering Twists in theory is the star player of the team, he actually, if you look at the stats for Mykonos, where they also made the final, they also beat SK, he actually wasn't that sick. That was actually one of his worst tournaments. And yet again, they beat SK, they made it to the final. They were a map from winning the final. I actually think 
that Elijah's role is very interesting, quite subtle, because here's the thing, he is still a star player. He's still a fantastic player who most of the big games turns up. He even turned up in that big final. But he kind of played the role of the closer here, where before he would get a lot of the kills and then they'd lose out and they'd lose all the late rounds. He was getting huge kills late in games. Like Twist was doing the early carrying, JDM was having good games. And then Elijah was kind of the guy who closes out around, who wins a clutch, who has the big frags towards the end, or who keeps you alive like he did on the overpass game until the others started to wake up on the T side. Side. And I think you look at it overall, and he is, he's still playing very, very good Counter-Strike. He's a very good fragger, but he's really, it does feel like he's shifted his role a bit. And, and crucially, he has kind of engaged himself as a player because we heard these stories that he now is, along with Nitro, watching the demos, studying the opponents. Before that, I got the sense he was a little bit more passive-aggressive. Like, he did his shit. He expected others to live up to their end of the deal. Maybe he privately talked about to certain teammates about things, but he never brought things up in a team context. He wasn't doing a good job there. Now it feels like he's doing a good job as a teammate, and he understands now from his time in the wilderness, taking that foray out into free agency, that you don't necessarily want to go and just stack up an all-star team like Cloud9 and actually you think he realizes he's dodged a bullet there and he's on a better team right now with more potential. JDM, I think, is good but is inconsistent as an AWPA. But overall, it's good in as much as you look at the big series they've played in, and he has had some really good series, and at least average series, where as an AWPA, he's doing his job, and he's only expected in this team to be the third star. He's not supposed to be a superstar, and I think he's actually kind of straddling that quite well at the moment, where he has big series, he has not that great series, but I don't think he's the main reason they lose games. Now, one of the things I think is really positive about this team is, for me, they play real CS on the T side. Their T side is really legit. For an NA team, I think it's probably the best T side I've actually ever seen from an NA team consistently because they play that proper CSGO, it's very sp specifically CSGO, entry and trade style where you either have to get the entry kill then you burst into that area but you don't necessarily rush the site you just take over that area for map control or if your guy dies who goes first you must trade onto him and therefore you've gone one for one it's still an, an advantageous scenario for the t's it's disadvantageous for the ct's and crucially when you play that style if you don't immediately then burst onto the site where you get a kill, you have to be very decisive all the same. Like, you have to read the game and then make a decisive call as to where you're going to go. You can't flounder between the sites. You can't just run the clock down all the time every time so they kind of know you're coming. I've seen some really good reads and some really decisive attacks and ex executes from Team Liquid that make me think this is practice paying off and this style looks repeatable. That is a style which it's not even about all your players getting their frags off. You can use that style to consistently put yourself in bomb plant, post plant situations and win big T rounds. And if you win a lot of T rounds, you do well on the on three or four maps on T side, you are going to have a lot of success. You are going to win big series and you are going to go deep in tournaments. That is a formula that succeeds as Astralis showed us. Hey, guess what? Astralis is not the most talented team in the world, but they definitely have talent and they have people who play their roles and they have people who have consistency and they had that very structured, consistent style on the T side, which again was entry and trade style. It was that slow punish style where they're the opponent re-peeks into you after, you after he gets a kill. He definitely dies every time. Now, here's the interesting thing. Part of the reason why I think this style is repeatable for Team Liquid is, first of all, it's not as if JDM and Stanislaw have been playing well all the time. Stanislaw had a terrible tournament in ESL in New York. JDM's had his off series, and they've still done fine. Nitro is creating his openings with Twist consistently, helping Twist be a star, and also getting a lot done himself. That's replicatable, repeatable, replicable. Elijah's been pretty consistent as that closing force. I mean, he had a godlike series against SK at Mykonos. He was the main reason they won that one. And he is always strong in the big series and the, the more important the game gets. He maintained his fragging power over more maps. Before, when he got the insane stats and the really good numbers, yeah, he would play like five, six maps a tournament. Now he's playing 11, 13 maps, and he's still maintaining the same numbers. That's what a fucking stud this guy is. I think he was even the best player by far on their team in the final. In fact, I thought he was better than some of the phase players. He was really strong in that final and didn't kind of like choke up in the same way as the others did. And he seems, as I said, more engaged with the team, which I think is a positive sign going forwards. When you have young players like Twist and you have people who are clearly confidence-based like JDM, I think when you have a Liege who's got his head screwed on now and not just an insane fragger like he is, but 
also really has like a good attitude in his team and is a positive effect, then you're going to have even more success as far as I'm concerned. And I also think he's a good counterbalance in terms of style because think of the three st three stars they've got. They've got Twists, insane first bullet, entry aggressive player. They've got a Liege, more of a passive, controlled, really sick spray. You take multiple opponents on and win clutches. And you've got JDM, more like a mid-round orper, but a guy who generally hits certain shots consistently and isn't relied upon to be the star, so you can have inconsistent games. I think you kind of covered the gamut of what stars you'd usually have on a team, and you've got a lot of different weapons there for Nitro and Stanislaw to use. The firepower in this team is really impressive. This isn't like some of the past NA teams where it was one or two players who had to get it done. First of all, in the SK series at NY, all five players fragged well. But particularly the stars, none of them was like super above the others like Elige was at Mykonos against SK. All three stars showed up, had really nice stats, really good consistent performances, and then the lesser qualities came to play. And guess what? In that series, they straight up legit beat the number one ranked team in the world. Twists at New York, despite the final, still had an MVP level performance. I think that's, that just shows that their ceiling for their star players also crazy. This is a guy in one or two years, he could be at the Nico or Simple level, though obviously he has to kind of show it much more than he has done now, because those guys have. Elige is so consistent in terms of his frags and his damage game to game, so that's pretty consistent and obviously an impressive second star or star depending on what type of game it is jdm's had his basic series he had the mouse sports final at mykonos he had the sk series at mykonos stanislaw even had a big series against big who admittedly aren't aren't that good a team admittedly i don't think personally but they're a tactical team he played well there and at mykonos in general he actually has some pretty good firepower remember it bearing in mind he's only supposedly like the fourth or fifth best player on this team when you think of the star hierarchy and then nitro is your in-game leader but first of all he had a big series against vp and yes overall his stats for new york were bad but he has his maps and his halves where he goes ham even in a very difficult entry in-game leading style role so the success they've already had is fucking insane. No one NA team's ever done anything comparable to this. They've beaten SK Gaming, who were ranked world number ones in two best of three series, back to back. They've beaten Astralis, one of the greatest teams of all time, in a best of three series. They've beaten Virtus Pro. Yes, Virtus Pro in a slump, in terrible form, but Virtus Pro still gets it done against other NA teams. Go look at the results. They get it done against Cloud9 at the Major. They beat Team Liquid themselves in... Um, Oh, it'd have been a Mykonos. So they're not a team that just crumble against everyone. I think the success is insane. Now you look at the map pool and it only gets more positive. So you look at the map pool, you get them onto Inferno, Mirage, Cobble. They're a very legit team. Then you go and look at Overpass and you have to consider one of those losses was the ridiculous FaZe one where FaZe picked it because SK had thrashed them on it. And so FaZe thought, easy win for us. And they were racking up massive T-side rounds against an insanely dominant CT team at that tournament. So I think you can add Overpass in there as well. So I'd say those four maps, I think they can play all of them. The, the other three are their big three. Inferno, they are very, very good on. They've won five of their last six. They've got a very strong T-side. They've beaten SK on it twice. They've beaten Verts Pro. They've beaten Astralis. The only team they lost to was FaZe. I'd make a case they're one of the best Inferno teams in the world. And since every team generally doesn't ban that, they can ride that out as their map pick. So that's very replicable. Then you look at Mirage, every team plays it right now pretty much. Even people like Envious and Nip stop banning it. They have a good T side on that map. The only teams that have beaten them on it, Virtus Pro, Astralis, FaZe. So in theory, two of them very strong teams on that map. One historically a very strong team on that map. And they have decent wins on it. Cobblestone, they beat SK on it twice, enough said. That's a sleeper map for SK that they usually win against everyone else. And they looked like they had a very solid T side on that map. Overpass, as I said, good T side overall. Losses, yes, to SK and FaZe. Now, SK picked it as a joker map, and FaZe obviously have strength on that map. It's one of their few core maps. Then you look at the other maps. Okay, Nuke, yes, they didn't do well in the games they played on. They clearly have picked it at times and wanted to play it. Virtus Pro got them on it. VP are just sometimes an anomaly on that map, or even in a slump, they're very good. Mouse Sports, I'd admit that was a that was a bizarre game and kind of disconcerting, bearing in mind people might pick Nuke against this team in the future. Cash actually looked pretty good. They barely lost to Astralis on that. Astralis plays it a bit, and we know they have a decent T side, but the guys from Team Liquid were absolutely hanging in there on that map. A map that the stat on the screen said they hadn't played in like something like 100 days or something ridiculous. Then in terms of train, they clearly don't mind playing it, but like winning against Big, losing against Mouse, I think that Mouse one was a bit dodgy because it was Oscar just going super fucking ham. Actually, no, it wasn't. I think that might have been Sunny. No, I think Oscar went pretty ham on that one. 
Uh, Train's just in the middle, I think, overall for them. So really, Nuke and Kasha are the only maps they're scared of and have to avoid. Overpass and Train depends on the opponent. And then they have three strong maps in Inferno Mirage, which everyone's willing to play. Sure, some teams don't play Cobble, but when they ban Cobble, you pick Inferno or Mirage. So I think the map pool's even pretty good to have a good chance to go deep in big tournaments. And here's the crucial thing. I don't think we've seen Team Liquid's best yet. I don't think these were the one-offs. Both of their huge results have come with some key underperformances, like really bad statistical performances. Twists at Mykonos relative to what the best player of your team should be doing, not good enough. Stanislaw ESL New York, ungodly bad for someone playing his role. Admittedly, not a star role, but even so, really, really bad. Still made the final, still almost beat FaZe. They're not playing out of their minds like NA teams were who had the big past NA results in history. When they play big series, here's a really, really great point. That's all their stars tend to show up. They at least get two of the three, and that puts them on the map and gives them a chance for their style to work and win the game. Then you look at the losses they've had. Nearly all of their map losses in these last two tournaments have been where either Twists or JDM played average to bad. When that happened, one of the two, then they would lose the map. As long as, as, long as two of the three turn up, as long as they don't both shit the bed... No problem. I even think the fact that they played so well on, on a map like Cash out of nowhere, which they couldn't know they were going to play, really great sign. So first of all, look at Team Liquid already in the pantheon of great NA teams. So the original Complexity and Cloud9 lineups always had good tactics, but they always lacked for a bit of firepower. Like in the first team, it was Hiko and Swag who had to go ham. Then later on, it was Shroud and Hiko who had to go ham when they lost Swag. They never had enough firepower to actually legit go deep past big European teams and win big events. It was not, wasn't really going to happen as good as they were at ESL on Cologne. Then you look at I by Power, right? The lineups that won those ESEA lands, those didn't feel that legit at the first one. A lot of that was tight and fucking around, and they just went ham in terms of individual play. Then... You look at the ladder lineup with Steel. Okay, they had some good fragging, I thought. They had some good team play. They didn't have a superstar play. Skadoodle was good, but I don't think he was on the level that Twists is right now. Although that's that's debatable, I guess. He was very good at certain times. He was kind of micromanaged by Dazed. But they weren't good enough on T-sides consistently, and they were pretty poor in majors. Team Liquid's two top four finishes at the majors. Okay, the, they were both one-off runs. And secondly, they both involved Simple going super ham to carry them, who is a godlike European player, not an NA player, and who will go down as one of the best players to ever play CSGO. So I feel like they were, to some degree, boosted there. Then you look at Cloud9 of late last year that won EPL. Okay, that was a one-off. And secondly, they massively relied on Stewie 2K and Automatic there, to a degree which is like unreasonable. And you have seen they haven't been able to do that consistently tournament to tournament since. And the Cloud9 of this summer, let's be real, they had some easy brackets and some easy runs. And they won a couple of big games, but they never beat any of the really elite teams. So I don't really count that as comparable to what Team Liquid's done already. So I have to say, I'm pretty invested in this Team Liquid team. I love the way they're playing. They're a lot of fun to watch. I think they can do a lot more. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and say they will do a lot more. Now, what's funny is people might think, oh, Darren's always had a bias for Team Liquid, hasn't he? Because they know that I was friends with Hiko, right? Here's a little detail people won't know. You know all those Team Liquid matches when they were at those majors and they made those deep runs? Never predicted them to make any of those. Never predicted them to get out of their groups. Never predicted them to win any of those series because they were all one-offs. Because I knew what that team was like. I knew what it was like internally. I knew, yes, they had this insane ceiling, but I thought it was unlikely they'd reach it. And so when they did those things, I, yeah, I tipped my hat like everyone else did, said what amazing forms. But I actually never picked them to win those series. Now, this team doesn't have Hiko, friend of mine a guy I very much respect the mentality of, doesn't have Simple, one of my favourite players, I think one of the most talented players ever, maybe the most talented to ever play CS, doesn't have either of them. But I picked them to win the final at ESL One New York. And I, by the way, even though, yes, there was a little bit of crazy like indecision where I changed my mind at last minute, I think that the basis for that was actually pretty, pretty well-rounded. And I'd stand by it right now, which is I think that that is their ceiling. I think if they could have turned up on the first map and played real Counter-Strike like they did on the second on the T-half of the second map overpass, because Inferno was their map, remember, I think they could have made all of those three maps really exciting. And they only needed to win one of them to get to a fourth map, which, is, which I think was... Was it Nuke? Or I think with Nuke and then the fifth map was trained. So I thought if they got to a fourth map, they had chances to win the series. And I thought they really could have given FaZe a match like they did on that second map once they really got into it. <clears throat> I think people like Twist just disappeared into nowhere all of a sudden in the final because he hasn't played well in a big final. He's only played two in his whole life. I think people like Stanislaw were mega shitting the bed. I think JDM got a bit scared in that final in a way that he wasn't in the Mykonos final. Again, stage matches and finals are bigger and much more significant deals psychologically than finals at smaller 
more events where you're playing in the same area. So I think that they absolutely could have done well there, and I think they will do well. So I'm going to go ahead and say, I think they can win big events. I think they can go deep in a major. I'm talking like semi-finals or further. The talent level, the style of play, the consistency, the fundamentals, the leadership setup, the roles, everything looks beautiful in this team right now. It's never been a better time to want to watch an, a top NA Counter-Strike team play because not only is their potential unleashed, not only is it insane, but they haven't even found it all yet. There's still a ceiling that they can go further for this team. What in God's name is that from Thorin?